Hello everyone, today I'll be talking about acute kidney injury. The first video will focus on definitions and etiologies, the second will cover the diagnostic evaluation, and the third will cover complications, presentation, and treatment. By the end of this video, you will be able to define acute kidney injury. To be able to describe the prerenal, intrarenal, postrenal framework for categorizing acute kidney injury, and you will be able to list its common etiologies. First up are some terms and definitions. When I was a student, and for generations before me, an abrupt decrease in kidney function was called acute renal failure or acute kidney failure. However, acute kidney injury, or AKI, is now the generally preferred term. I see two major benefits to AKI over older terms. First, AKI was intended to resolve the numerous, conflicting, and sometimes vague definitions that were used for acute renal failure and acute kidney failure. And second, it highlights that there is a range of kidney impairment which is clinically significant, but which falls short of overt organ failure. AKI is defined by the presence of any of the following. A creatinine increase by 0.3 mg per deciliter or more within a span of 48 hours a creatinine increase by 50% or more above the patient's baseline within a span of 7 days, or a urine output which is below 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for at least 6 hours. In practice, I find that clinicians don't adhere too strictly to this definition as it's not perfect. For example, if a patient's Foley catheter is clogged, they may have no urine output for over 6 hours, yet experience absolutely no change in their renal function. Also, many perfectly healthy patients can have a creatinine that varies by 0.3 mg per deciliter or more, despite a complete absence of medical problems. And while an increase in the creatinine of 0.3 is likely to be significant in a patient whose creatinine goes from 0.5 to 0.8, it probably is not in a patient whose creatinine goes from 4.5 to 4.8. Let's take a quick look at why that's the case. The best index of overall kidney function is something called the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. The GFR represents the rate of fluid movement across the glomerular capillary membrane. The higher the GFR, the better the kidneys are working. Unfortunately, the GFR cannot be measured directly and must instead be estimated, and the easiest way to do so is from the serum creatinine according to any of a variety of equations, which also incorporate age, sex, and sometimes race. What all the estimation equations share in common is that they result in curves similar to this one. As creatinine increases, GFR decreases, but in a non-linear fashion. Consider if a person's creatinine were to increase from 1 to 2 milligrams per deciliter, that represents a dramatic reduction in GFR and thus a dramatic reduction in kidney function. Whereas an increase in creatinine from 9 to 10 mg per deciliter represents a negligible decrease in kidney function. So when evaluating how severe someone's kidney injury is, think about the increase in creatinine in relative terms, not absolute terms. Returning to the definitions, there are a couple of additional ones that you'll need to know when discussing a patient with AKI. Uremia is a constellation of signs and symptoms seen in either severe AKI or in end-stage chronic kidney disease. It includes nausea and vomiting, anorexia, fatigue, lethargy, and confusion. Azotemia refers to a buildup of nitrogen-containing metabolic waste products in the blood. In practice, the only such compound we routinely measure is urea, or blood urea nitrogen, as it's known in the U.S. in the context of lab tests. And so-called pre-renal azotemia is an elevation of serum urea in the absence of an elevation in creatinine that is specifically due to poor renal perfusion. I'll talk about why this happens in the next video. One final term is acute kidney insufficiency, which confusingly is also abbreviated AKI. This term is not clearly defined, and its use should be avoided. Okay, so enough with the definitions. Let's move on to discuss etiologies.
Etiologies of acute kidney injury are classically divided into three categories based largely on anatomy. Most obviously, AKI can occur from a problem primarily within the kidney itself. This is called intrarenal AKI. One can subdivide intrarenal etiologies. So there is intrinsic renovascular disease in which the problem is in the small blood vessels within the kidney. This category includes hypertensive emergencies, small vessel vasculitis, and the related conditions of thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and hemolytic uremic syndrome. Intrarenal disease can also occur within the glomerulus. While there are many glomerular diseases that can cause nephrotic syndrome and chronic kidney disease, they are not common causes of AKI per se. However, one of the more frequent glomerular diseases to do so is post-infectious glomerulonephritis. And we also have the tubulointerstitial diseases. The most notable example is acute tubular necrosis or ATN, which itself can be caused by many, many things, including sepsis, medication toxicity, iodine containing intravenous contrast for CT scans, rhabdomyolysis, and any cause of so-called prerenal AKI, which goes uncorrected for too long. This category also includes a condition usually called acute interstitial nephritis, or less commonly, allergic interstitial nephritis, most classically caused as a drug side effect. There is no standard range for onset of AKI in drug-induced AIN, but for most drugs, the time interval is several days to several weeks after the drug was initiated. In addition to the intrarenal etiologies, there are etiologies that happen downstream of the kidneys within the GU system. This is called post-renal AKI, also known as obstructive uropathy and or obstructive nephropathy, because they are all the consequences of impaired urine drainage, which increases pressure within the ureters, which is then transmitted to the kidneys collecting ducts and tubules, and ultimately transmitted to the individual glomeruli. The obstruction can be caused by anywhere within the renal pelvis down to the urethromiatus. That obviously includes the ureters, though since the kidneys have largely redundant function, obstructing only one ureter will generally not lead to kidney injury. Both ureters usually need to be obstructed, and that obstruction can either be internal, as in a stricture, or bilateral kidney stones, or it can be external compression, for example, from an intra-abdominal tumor. Postrenal AKI can also be due to a so-called neurogenic bladder, which cannot generate the contractions necessary to void properly. It can be uncommonly from urinary tract infections, in which either inflammatory debris or edema leads to obstruction of the urethra. Various medications can directly interfere with the GU system. And last, benign prostatic hypertrophy is a significant cause of obstruction. And just as we have etiologies that occur downstream from the kidneys, we have those that occur upstream as well, which predictably lead to prerenal AKI. Prerenal AKI is due to some problem with getting blood to the kidneys. This can be a primary cardiac issue, an issue with the blood vessels, or an inadequate volume of blood circulating. So for specific etiologies, there is dehydration from any cause, heart failure that leads to kidney injury, is sometimes called cardiorenal syndrome, though not all nephrologists like that term. And the liver failure that leads to kidney problems is called hepatorenal syndrome. The specific mechanisms of cardiorenal and hepatorenal syndromes are beyond the scope of this particular video. You may have noticed that there are three etiologies starred, dehydration, ATN, and BPH. That's because these three etiologies are by far the most common cause of AKI among hospitalized adults. So I mentioned that there were some medications that could lead to AKI, but this is a big enough problem that I think it's worth discussing in more detail. After all, medication-induced AKI is one of the few causes of AKI which is iatrogenic. These medications can be grouped according to the mechanism by which they cause AKI, analogous to how all etiologies are grouped. So first are those meds which cause prerenal problems. The obvious ones here are diuretics leading to dehydration. 
Another subcategory are meds which alter intravenal autoregulation. What does this mean? Well, let's first consider ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Angiotensin II normally vasoconstricts both the afferent arterial leading to the glomerulus as well as the efferent arterial leading away from the glomerulus, but the effect is greater on the efferent side. The consequence of this is that angiotensin II increases the pressure gradient driving fluid across the glomerular membrane. This increases the GFR. So when either an ACE inhibitor or ARB interfere with the actions of angiotensin II, the consequence is a vasodilation of the efferent arterial out of proportion to the afferent arterial, leading to a decrease in the pressure gradient and a decrease in the GFR. So while this might make the glomerulus itself happier, it can reduce the kidney's function. NSAIDs also belong in this category. To understand why, consider another relevant class of signaling molecule called prostaglandins. Prostaglandins normally help with renal autoregulation by vasodilating the afferent arterioles, but the mechanism of action for NSAIDs is to inhibit the synthesis of prostaglandins. If afferent arterioles cannot vasodilate as much as the body needs, it inhibits optimal perfusion of the glomeruli, which decreases renal perfusion and will decrease GFR. And last in this category are the calcineurin inhibitors, cyclosporine and tacrolimus. These drugs are believed to directly vasoconstrict both the afferent and the efferent arterioles through an unknown mechanism. Despite the fact that the effects of these drugs are occurring within the kidney itself, I've placed them into the pre-renal category. That's because the hemodynamic effect of these drugs on the kidney's function is grossly similar to true causes of pre-renal AKI but that's certainly a debatable categorization about which one should not be too dogmatic. Drugs that fall into the true intravenal category include those which directly cause ATN. Aminoglycosides are particularly infamous for this, but the chemotherapeutic cisplatin and the antiviral tenofovir both belong here as well. Regarding AIN, or acute interstitial nephritis, Many, many drugs have been implicated as potential causes for this condition, but most commonly are beta-lactam antibiotics, vancomycin, the combination drug sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim, marketed in the U.S. as Bactrim, and NSAIDs also fall here as well. Of note, one half of Bactrim, the trimethoprim, can inhibit the normal secretion of creatinine in the proximal tubules and thus can result in an increase in serum creatinine in the absence of a decrease in actual GFR. Although this should not really be considered AKI since the kidneys are otherwise working, it's almost impossible to differentiate this situation from true AKI, and the medication should probably be stopped nonetheless. The last main category of nephrotoxic drugs in the intravenal category are those causing what's called crystal nephropathy which is when a drug precipitates out of the urine and forms crystals, which can clog tubules and collecting ducts, and even form larger renal stones leading to downstream obstruction. Acyclovir is the most commonly cited culprit here, but this is also reported with gancyclovir, ciprofloxacin, sulfamethoxazole, and methotrexate. With all these drugs, risk of precipitation is related to dose, urine pH, and whether the patient is volume replete or deplete. There are also many meds implicated with post-renal AKI or acute urinary retention. They do this through some combination of decreased bladder sensation, interference with a normal contraction of the bladder's detrusor muscle, and or excessive tone of the urinary sphincters. The most common meds to do this include opiates, sipathomimetics such as nasal decongestants, and any drug with significant anticholinergic effect, including antihistamines, tricyclic antidepressants, some SSRIs, and some antiemetics. Irrespective of which med is being used, there are general risk factors for developing drug-induced nephrotoxicity. Most critically, exposure to multiple nephrotoxins at the same time. So, for example, starting a high-dose NSAID, in a heart failure patient already on diuretics and an ACE inhibitor, or giving a large quantity of iodine-containing IV contrast to a patient on aminoglycosides. 
Other risk factors include pre-existing renal insufficiency, intravascular volume depletion, advanced age with a very rough cutoff of around 60 years, give or take a decade, sepsis, and diabetes. That concludes this discussion of the definition of AKI and an overview of its etiologies. The next video will cover the diagnostic evaluation.